Wonderful. Well, it is such a pleasure to be with you. I'm only sorry I am not there physically. It would be such a pleasure. Um, my hope today is to introduce you. Some of you may be far along actually in this, but at least introduce all of you at one level or another to not only paradox theory, um, but the paradox community of scholars, because it is exceptionally international. I just returned from Boston and the Academy of Management, where it was it was truly energizing to be around with people from around the world studying tensions that we live in so many so many ways. So I'm going to share my screen and uh, I'm happy to share these slides as well. So you all see this here. Um, I've been studying tensions for about 25 years. And when I talk about tensions, I mean competing demands that pull us in opposing directions. And particularly in the grand many would say wicked problems that you're addressing in this conference, those tensions truly surface. These are tensions such as, you know, work with that I've done with Unilever and so many firms around the tensions between social responsibilities and fiscal responsibilities for organizations, between how do we meet the demands of today and ensure a thriving tomorrow? How do we support ourselves, the we, but also recognize the they and avoid these becoming truly antagonistic and sometimes paralyzing tensions. So my work really began early in my PhD. And I, I'm going to note a couple of uh, research papers, should those be helpful to, to you that are starting to explore this world. Um, but in AMR 2000, I wrote a, a paper called Toward a Theory of Paradox and came to this understanding as I was studying tensions that there was something more there, that these were a pattern between the tensions, what felt like in a dilemma, what felt like the tug of war, these reinforcing dynamics that could make it quite a bit worse and challenging, but could also help us find ways to live, thrive, and learn through tensions. And finally, management approaches to tackling and working through these tensions on an ongoing basis. Our default, at least what I've found in my work, particularly with Wendy Smith, is to either or thinking. This is formal logic, and I am not criticizing either or thinking. Sometimes this is exactly what we need to be doing. It is faster, more efficient. This is a trade-off approach. This is put the two up, up options on opposite sides, weigh the pros and cons and make a decision and move on. The limitation, however, of either or thinking is especially when you're dealing with these more wicked challenges, we are very limited by either or. I mean, are we really constrained to two options? But worse, what I've found is that we can, through either or thinking, trigger some traps or vicious cycles. And here's what I mean by that. Uh, and Sandra Murthy and Lewis in AMR, we, we dive into this, but, but Wendy Smith and I do as well. The first we call the rabbit hole. And what I mean by this is that we, when we are facing dilemmas, tend to increasingly lean in our favored direction. It is where we are most comfortable. It is where we have the greatest um, skills, habits, systems. In the case of financial versus social responsibility for firms, this is very usually on the financial side, but I've studied nonprofits as well. And actually their challenge is they may lean toward the social and by not having the financial, they don't have the resources to support themselves. So you go down this rabbit hole as you increasingly lean toward one side in your trade-offs and find yourselves in the second vicious cycle that we've studied, which we call overcorrection. It happens again and again in firms and leaders we've probably experienced in our own lives. We find ourselves too far leaning in one direction and we overcorrect, we swing the pendulum to the other side and actually do damage to the good we've done 
on one side for the sake of the other, right? A case of this in my research is Lego organization, which had focused so much on hitting the demands and controls of today that they had forgotten to really innovate for tomorrow. And when they overcorrected, they brought themselves to the brink of bankruptcy in five years because they were so focused on radical and risky innovation. And then the third vicious cycle we call trench warfare. This is polarization. The challenges that happen when you have different individuals or groups on opposite sides in different rabbit holes fighting for their side rather than listening and seeking synergies or at least connections between the two. Uh, in terms of research, to give you a sense of where you might explore, the Sunder Murphy and Lewis work that I did was around governance, opposing differing views on how you should design your board. And I won't go into this research, but I share it for those of you who study these dynamics or see them and would like to explore. What we came to do in this research is examine how leaning too far towards control leads one vicious cycle, whereas leaning toward, too hard towards collaboration actually creates a different but still vicious cycle. There is a better approach. Thankfully, what I, I found in 25 years of research is that a host of leaders, as well as their organizations and individuals, learn how to navigate these tensions. And they do so by shifting their view from trade-offs to paradoxes. And I love the symbol of yin-yang. I often turn to it to remind myself or when I'm working with executives, how the opposing sides, as in the yin and yang, create a greater whole flow into one another. They are contradictory, but they are also interdependent. They are linked. And because of that, they persist, meaning they do not go away. We may make a decision today, but we will face the same tension again in the near future. So coming to accept them and embrace them even as opportunities is vital. And here are some techniques that we have found and researchers are starting to explore on how to navigate. So rather than this either or approach that is the default, what we found is an approach to both and thinking, to applying a paradox mindset and shifting the approach. Let me show you three key steps in related research. The first is to change the question because our questions limit, they bound the way we approach a problem. So a key element for us is, and this is not simply a word or, or and, it is the assumptions underlying the dilemma we face. A research example of this to explore is work that I did with Lada Lusher with Lego. And this was action research when Lego was undergoing a massive strategic restructuring and middle managers were asking, how in the world do I manage self-managed teams? And this, this uh, view here of a process is not a tried true process that you must follow. It was how they started to work through from a mess to a more workable certainty to navigate these tensions. But core to this effort was changing the question, asking different questions about how to live for the future. I saw yeah, yeah, I saw perhaps I have the connection. This is from our side. Yeah. Apologies, is this, if, if, can you not hear me anymore? Um, can you go back just when you started to talk about Lego because we had a shortage from our side. Oh, thank you, thank you for letting me know. Thank you. Okay, what I was saying for Lego, this Lego study was an example of changing the question that helped us work with managers at Lego to rethink their starting point. And by a starting point, I literally mean asking different questions. Rather than asking, do I focus on today's targets or build teams for the future? 
how do I build teams for the future that can meet today's targets? How can I empower my teams through efficiency and rigor? So more examples can be found in this study, but it is about changing the questions we ask. The second tactic we call separating and connecting. Separating to recognize the deep value of the opposing sides and connecting to find a higher purpose or framework that can hold them together. An example of this work can be found in Andreopolis and Lewis. It's an org science from 2009. We were working with product design firms and studying how do they manage exploration and exploitation. This puts us together, the, e, the both and, change the question, separate and analyze. But the third piece is really helping leaders see what the outcomes might look like differently. Rather than a trade-off, we found two examples repeatedly in our research. The first we call a mule. Smarter than a donkey, stronger than a horse. This is creative integration. How do you find a win-win? Example, Unilever entering the markets into Africa with shampoo. Paul Pullman would say, show me the financials and show me the socials. And he would push individuals to develop both sides. And the win-win, their mule, was the diverse use of a sachet, a small packet that reduced water, reduced packaging, and in so doing, reduced costs and served the local community so it built customers. Therefore, it was highly profitable and reduced their environmental footprint. The limit of a mule is they are, as the analogy, sterile, meaning they're one-offs. They do not replicate themselves. So you do need to keep moving forward. The more often approach that we've found in our research, we call the tightrope walker. It is consistent inconsistency. It's recognizing we must continue to live for today and tomorrow, for the social and the financial, for the we and the they, but we make micro shifts along the way always looking to this higher purpose in the future and moving forward. In our work measuring a paradox mindset, this is what I'm showing you here is actually a psychometric measure and the link that is now, this is now a tool being used extensively at the more micro level to study, can we develop this kind of thinking in individuals and does it matter? The measure has two dimensions. Do you see tensions? That's the experiencing tensions side. And do you embrace them or do you avoid them? And what we have found, and we have studied this in many languages now, is that a paradox mindset has three benefits. According to the supervisors of over a thousand people we have studied, those with a high paradox mindset, meaning they see, both see and embrace tensions, paradoxically, have higher performance and are more creative. From the perspective of the individuals, they are also more satisfied. We would suggest that is a powerful three-point outcome. The last image I just want to show is work that came out of our dynamic equilibrium paper. This is an AMR from 2011, and it won the Decade of War, and I don't mean that as a brag. I mean, it has been remarkable how much this has been used. And I'd love to ask questions, answer questions, but I also wanna share this. The Paradox community is now hundreds of scholars large across the world. The um, Camille Pratis email is a net is a newsletter helping scholars connect around the world. There are remote global conferences regularly at the PhD student level and senior level. Um, there are LinkedIn groups to help find each other. And so I would, we may be out of time, but I'm I'm hoping not, and I'd love to be able to answer questions 
and see how I might support you in your work.